Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar on uh, build versus buy automated accessibility tools. Uh, my name is Laura Goslin. I'm DQ's event manager and marketing analyst. I'm going to be moderating today's webinar um, and fielding quest any questions uh, people have at the end to our panelists. So first, I'm going to um, get into some housekeeping. Um, if you do require captions for today's webinar, you can access those via the closed captions button at the bottom of Zoom or by accessing the stream text link I put in chat. Um, also, we're going to save the last 15 minutes or so in today's webinar for questions. So if you do have questions, um, save those till the end, but you can also put them in the Q&A um, button um, in Zoom or the chat button and we'll get those fielded to the panelists. And lastly, today's webinar is being recorded. We'll be sending out the recording and slides to all attendees after the fact. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, the agenda for today's webinar, we're gonna be um, describing what it takes to build an accessibility solution, i.e. what um, the time it takes, the resources, uh, the support it takes to support um, a built accessibility solution. We're also going to talk about how a bot solution can put you at a better starting point um, with accessibility. And lastly, we're going to do an in-depth review of features of a bot solution, such as HTML reporting, supported out-of-the-box findings and integrations, and custom rules. Our panelists today include Mark Stedman. Uh, Mark has six years of web development experience. Before DQ, he was at a large uh, insurance company, a Fortune 50 company, as an accessibility software developer. Um, so he has firsthand experience of what it, uh, what it is like to try to uh, build an accessibility solution uh, versus buying one. So he's going to tell that story for us today. Uh, Mark is also an expert um, in single page applications and accessibility testing for developers. Next, we have Travis Maraska. Travis has 10 years of experience, uh, four of which uh, were at a top 10 bank as a web developer and web accessibility lead. Travis is an expert in, in accessibility testing for large enterprise companies. Um, and then lastly, we have Tony Kornminer. Uh, he has 17 years of dev experience, five of which focus on web accessibility testing. Tony um, is at DQ focusing on our dev services as our team lead and is an expert at helping companies succeed with their um, accessibility testing. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Mark and he's gonna tell his story um, of what it takes to build an accessibility solution. Thanks, Laura. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and tell a story. And it's, it's personal to me because I went through it at a large Fortune 50 company, um, a large insurance company. Um, and the story starts like this. Um, there was an idea. And the idea was, could we build our own accessible solutions, right? Um, the idea was, could we test for content at build time? Could we test for it in line? Could we create like a GUI, right? A graphical user interface where someone could scan their content automatically, right? Not even have to be a developer, right? Um, and inherently, that idea made its way to me. Um, and of course, the initial developer spark me said, yes, right, let's do it. This is awesome, Let, let's go with it, let's, let's, make this, uh, let's make this happen, right? And what's great about it is the developer spark me basically said, I wanna be able to create some cool solutions that could test for accessibility, and then build that solution from scratch, right? Because I had heard, other companies, not even just accessibility solutions, just solutions in general, right? Um, to call their own, right? To call it your own, to own it, to say, yes, we own this content, right? I created an accessibility testing tool um, and just that spark got me going, right? But what I didn't realize was once we kind of started to put the pieces together, of, okay, can we do this, right? You, you start to look at a couple of factors that go into it, right? And the three factors that came out of um, kind of the initial idea and the spark of this was time, resources, and support. Um, and I'm gonna go into each one of these factors individually, because um, each one of these built into um, this idea that could we do this, right? Because um, again, this is a Fortune 50 company, it's a large company we tried to do this at, right? Um, and inherently, large companies, there's so many different things happening at the same time that it can, you have to look at it from these three different perspectives to see if it is possible. So the first one, getting into it, is time, right? Um, so full disclosure, I came from a web development team. Um, I knew um, some of the main uh, tech stacks that our company had had, um, and 
I figured most of the company was using those standards, those type of things, right? But when it came down to it, it takes a lot of time to figure out what the needs are of every development team that exists in a large organization, right? So identification of the types of tools that we would need, uh, looking at testing frameworks, right? If you guys know, testing frameworks change almost monthly, right? Um, there's new trends, new things that come out with it all the time. So initially my thought was, hey, there's gonna be, you know, some testing frameworks, most of them are inherently gonna be the exact same. But when I started to look at it, it took me so much time to figure out all the different intricacies, different types of testing frameworks that existed within just our organization, right? And it took a while to kind of get those labeled out. And just that amount of time it took for me and a few other folks off of project, off of resources, it's difficult, right? It made it very difficult to understand, you know, all those intricacies. The other one for types of tools is CI, CD pipeline support, right? Most large companies, a DevOps team controls your Jenkins, your Bamboo, right? Your CI, CD pipeline support, right? And it makes it difficult. It does. It inherently makes it very difficult for you to get the time of those people to be like, hey, how could we do this so that we can get the most out of this tool we're creating, right? Um, so those two things, identification of types of tools, that's just one factor. The next factor was identification of teams that would take on the work specifically, right? Um, not all access or not all companies have accessibility teams to take on the work. I was blessed to be on an accessibility team within this large organization, um, but not all companies, big companies have an accessibility team to kind of spearhead this, right? And even so, I needed some other people's help, right? I'm gonna develop this piece or I'm gonna help develop it, but I need those people's guidance. If I don't have it, right, I'm, I'm basically just shooting to the wind, whatever I think is gonna work for them, right? So identification of teams that could help take on the work was a large chunk of time just getting those teams in order, right? Um, and the last one, kind of separate from the first two, because that's more time it takes to identify those pieces and kind of plan it out. Um, inherently, comes down to building, testing, and implementing, right? Um, think about it. It's a lot of time just daily. If you build something from scratch, um, it takes a lot of time and effort to get there, right? Um, and this is no different. Um, when we came down to it, looking at building, testing, implementing, it's a lot of work. Um, it comes down to, is the time and effort there to do all these things? And so initially when we were going through this, we looked at this, um, we did identify a couple of teams that were pretty prominent that we could kind of work with to see again, can we get there? So again, all this time has passed. We haven't really gotten to coming down to building it yet, but again, we've identified, we've used a lot of time. But after time, right, we jump into specific resourcing, right? So when we look at resourcing itself, um, this was a huge factor in the fact that resourcing and time kind of play together closely, but I like to have it separate. Um, so when we talk about resourcing, um, it comes down to who's gonna do the work, right? Um, again, not all companies have accessibility teams, but we were blessed to have one. But again, you need other people's input and other people's help to create these accessible solutions, right? Because you're not gonna be the end all, you know, end all be all for everything, right? So who's gonna do the work? Um, that first question I can tell you right now is automatically met with a lot of resistance because inherently, right? Kind of plays into that last point that's on there too. Time and effort, right? How are we gonna to get to it? Who's gonna do it, right? Um, so who's gonna do the work, right? So we had identified a couple of teams which kind of help us do the work, which was good, right? So now what are the skill sets needed? Um, this is one that actually shocked me when I first started getting into this. I was like, okay, I have these guys lined up, okay? Sweet, we're gonna do this integration, let's go, right? But come to find out, even within the same development teams, there's multiple tech stacks happening, right? We had Java, we had Java-based uh, applications, but JavaScript frameworks behind the scenes that were running the test cases, right? So inherently, I need to get somebody specifically who does those JavaScript frameworks things because within certain teams, there was different skill sets with it, right? So how do you get that, right? How do you get that specific person, right? Because the buy-in piece that we got was, hey, we're going to get this one person to come to us, but that one person doesn't have that skill set. We need, we need this other person, right? So it's one of the things that I ran into. And again, looking at it, we had a bunch of different solutions, Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, Ruby, right? We're like, oh, by the time we started looking at it, we're like, whoa, that's a lot of different things you have to cover, right? Um, and again, most companies, just even team to team, right? They have, they consist of multiple tech stacks, right? Um, but the biggest thing from resourcing that I can say, and the hardest argument to make is time and effort off of regular work. Um, 
let's be honest, we live in a agile development world, right? Um, and the hardest thing to do is tell a product owner, a project manager, right? Even, a, even somebody who's just a manager in general, right? Upper leadership. I need somebody to sacrifice work that's normally done and buy in to help me make this successful solution to help me out, right? Um, because inherently, right, it's tough. With how fast software and things get developed in, in this day and age, especially where I was at before, it's super hard to win that argument. I need such and such for this long, right? Very, very difficult to do that. Um, and this was the biggest fight and pushback that we had gotten was, we can't let these people off their regular work to help you out with this. Sure, we can give you a little bit of a lot of time um, because you know, inherently they still have to get their work done. But even with that, looking at it from a large organization perspective, we're trying to push this successful solution out. We needed more, right? We needed more and we couldn't really get that. And that's what made it really difficult. So eventually, full disclosure, when we got to the resourcing part, it kind of started to crumble a little bit, right? We still were kind of going forward, right? We had some buy-in from teams. Um, we still had some time and effort. We still had some of the skill sets that we needed. Um, but again, we're still in that mode where we don't necessarily know what it is um, specifically that we're making. If we're making something specific to a team or making something generic. We don't know because we don't have that input from all those teams to help us out, right? And that's what's very difficult with resourcing is you have to be able to find out who's going to do it, your skill sets you need, and then the time and effort are going to work. But even with that, we still got to the point where we were able to get to a support phase. And this is the one um, that, in my experience, is uh, it's, it's extremely difficult. Um, initially, when you hear this, I'll say the kind of generic thing that happens with support, right? So I got through this part. We got to a solution that we kind of had something going, had some people kind of testing, messing around with it. And when we got to it, it was support. So who will support and maintain the tool, right? So if um, this development team picks it up, they start using it, um, whatever the solution happens to be, they start using it, they find some issues, right? It doesn't work the way it does. An update came through um, with Node because that happens all the time. Um, something broke along the way, right? Who's gonna support it, right? Is it the development teams themselves because those guys have helped us out? Is it an accessibility team that has uh, developers tied to it? Is it somebody else? Do you have an open source team that sponsors it, right? Who does that, right? And that answer was super tough to, to have because inherently they all wanted to push it back to the accessibility team, right? And that's difficult because then your job becomes 100% of that, right? But even then, right, let's say you have that buy-in, right? You have that buy-in you have teams that say i want to support this i helped you make this we'll support this on our team um, the biggest thing that people forget is if a developer helped create that content what happens when they leave um, this is a huge thing especially in larger larger organizations you see it a lot um, trade out developers going to different teams right movement within the same organization even leaving the organization right um, everybody always says there's going to be a knowledge transfer always um, full disclosure, that knowledge transfer probably happens very few times because of how quick people want to move off of a team or they want to start doing their new stuff, right? So when you look at it, right, who then becomes the owner, right? Yeah, they can disseminate some knowledge to the next person next to them. But what we tend to find is, is when we had buy-in, we had somebody leave and go to a different team. I couldn't reach out to that person because the new person he was working with, the new project manager wouldn't let me reach out to him because that was no longer his thing, right? So now I'm reaching out to somebody who doesn't know as much about the changing stuff, and now it's starting to trickle down, fall flat a little bit. And then the last piece is, do we have time made out to fix bugs? And this is where it kind of fell flat, right? Is bugs happen, right? Um, inherently, things happen behind the scenes, right? If you use an open source tool like uh, Axe Core, which is RDQ um, Accessibility Rules Engine, we have updates, right? If an update comes through and let's say all of a sudden I make something very specific to it, right? And somehow it breaks it. Who's gonna fix the bug? If that team was there making those changes, who fixes that bug, right? Um, and this is where we kind of started to fall flat. Full disclosure, um, we, we got to this point where we had this support everything was there and we're like, okay, we've got this. But when it came to supporting it, everything started to kind of flatten out and fall flat. 
Um, and support also has one more thing behind it, um, which isn't necessarily listed here, but it is a really good thing to note. Support also means people who actually want to use it, right? We lost all support. Um, our backing for it, our idea to try to do it fell. So we lost all support behind the scenes for it. People kind of were just like, ah, we don't have time to do this now, right? We don't, have, we don't really want to do that. We don't have time and effort to do that, right? So not just like a physical, hey, I'm going to support this tool, just in, the, in general supporting of the tool itself was gone. There was no management upper level thing you wanted to do with it. And now you're back to square one, right? Um, and again, I say all these things I'm talking about right now as my own personal experience going through this stuff, right? It is a difficult process inherently to build an accessible solution. It is, as with everything you do in software development, right? But the good news is, right? I'm speaking from a large organization's perspective. If you are a smaller organization, and let's say across the board, right, you can go down time, resources, and support and say, right, I have the same tech stack, right? I have the same unit testing framework that I'm using across the board, right? Yeah, you could build, you could absolutely build your own accessible solution using something of, of an open source tool. Absolutely, right? But when it comes to a larger organizations and, and, and you know, even growing organizations, right, there tends to be, that multiple layers, right, um, of different tech stacks, right, different things you need to support, who's gonna do it, the buy-in, right? It gets difficult. So absolutely, right, I'm not gonna sit here and say, you can't do a build, you can't do a uh, build your own solution, right? It, it, you can, absolutely. But it does make it difficult um, when you look at it from a large organization's perspective, right? Which is where we're gonna kind of jump into now, um, specifically examples of when a thought solution um, can actually put you at a better starting point to where if you're looking at where I'm at, right, um, and you drop, right, um, you can actually uh, start at a better starting point. So I'm going to pass this over to Tony, um, who now talk on when a uh, bot solution can put you at a better starting point. All right. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. So to, you know, speak to a lot of the different subjects that Mark told in his story, uh, I just want to kind of pull a couple up to the surface uh, that relate to you know, kind of like what you would get when you uh, go with a bot solution and some of the, you know, kind of uh, benefits that professional support and things like that uh, get you. And a couple of the topics in which, you know, we tend to do at DQ, like when we, when we package up our, uh, our, our products, uh, a lot of times we include professional startup services as part of that purchase. And what that typically gets you is access to um, people that uh, I have on my team, which are, you know, professional integrators. Uh, we do this work all the time. You know, there's like an expert level knowledge around uh, the subject matter uh, when it comes to different build systems and different test stacks. Um, you know, we've dealt with a lot of different companies just across the board in which, you know, we have seen, you know, different scenarios, uh, you know, complex systems, uh, you know, pretty much anything and everything. And, you know, you're dealing with folks that are uh, experts with the product. And, you know, they also have the knowledge that really matters when, you know, like you're looking to really make progress in this way. And, you know, a lot of the things that we try to offer uh, in this space when it comes to professional support is, uh, you know, like getting the customer to done in, in a spot like where, you know, there's, you know, just buying the product doesn't magically make it work like in your scenario. So, you know, th th there's a lot of different things that, you know, can get in the way of an implementation. And when you're dealing with folks, um, you know, like our team that has, you know, been through a lot of these different situations, um, you know, we provide solutions for that and it's all kind of part of the package. So, you know, there's a lot of benefit there. And one of the other, you know, things that I wanted to call out from Mark's story was um, the, the story about like the, the teams, the, the team members kind of like rolling off of um, the, you know, either his team or, you know, you, you get that little bit of kind of like segmented knowledge. And when, you know, you're dealing with a, a built solution, you know, you always run the risk of, you know, this person that has all this siloed knowledge, you know, getting another job or, you know, rotating off onto some other team. And then all that work that they put into creating this, uh, you know, tool 
um, you know, it just kind of goes with it. And, you know, like it might be successful for a little bit, but when, one of the things that you want to kind of focus on is a strategy. You know, you want to put in place something that sticks. So um, with what you get with professional support, um, you know, we work a lot with helping companies kind of like develop that strategy and, you know, kind of making it a repeatable process that's insulated to that kind of turnover. And it's, it's incredibly important that, you know, it's something that comes with documentation. It comes with, you know, folks that just have a lot of, you know, just baseline knowledge in, in this subject. And so, um, you know, all in all, you know, I mean, like for me, you know, like there's a lot of things that we like to, you know, like associate with this kind of, um, you know, service offering and things like that. But, you know, like really what we're looking to do is just try to ensure a path to success for customers. And it's, you know, just incredibly important to have a wealth of information or, you know, like a wealth of background, you know, like in some of these key areas that help kind of benefit and stand up that, you know, bot solution that you would provide in, in that type of scenario. So, um, you know, uh, I think I'll kick it back to Mark and, you know, he can talk a little bit more about some of the seamless integrations and things like that. But, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's important just to have that kind of uh, backing to, you know, that bot solution. That's a, definitely a, um, a benefit for that bot solution. Thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, so looking at, can we talk about seamless integration? Um, we have multiple examples, um, including my own, where um, we kind of got to that starting point where it was like, okay, we can't do the build solution because this has got so many X's and O's are going to place. So how can we kind of get a seamless integration to it, right? Um, there's a couple examples I'm going to talk about here. There's one specifically where um, we have a puppeteer integration um, with someone and they were working with them. And as we we're doing it, they kind of had their own built solution and they were kind of describing the same scenario that I did, right? Stuff was kind of falling apart at the seams. They couldn't necessarily get the buy-in back for it. Um, we went in with the bot solution with a puppeteer integration and then boom, they're off and running, right? Um, my same scenario, right? Um, we had a holistic approach, right? Um, large company, right? I, I've said it a few times. You look at it, you have to fill in those gaps for special cases. Everybody's going to have different testing frameworks. Everybody's going to have a different build process, right? And with that bot solution, going back to what Tony said, right? You have professional support to help you in those, in those uh, off chance cases, right? Um, and another one too, we also had a couple of integrations I've seen that are more of like a, a kind of a hack together integration um, for, you know, tightly scripted languages, you know, like C sharp, Java, right? Um, what ends up happening is, is that they don't work 100% the way they want. So we actually came in with a bot version of it that had Java with it. And then and all of a sudden, boom, they're off and running. Um, 50 test cases up in the same day. Um, and they're out the door. They've got documentation, they've got support, right? Um, and, and that's kind of the seamless integration and the holistic approach right there, right? A bot solution can get you to that point, but the last thing it can do is it can get you to done way faster, right? Um, a, a lot of times people come to us and say, you know, we really just need to get this up and running and we need to stop the bleeding. And that's what it can do. It can stop the bleeding by catching 40 to 60% accessibility issues, um, specifically talking about um, our test integration but that can stop that bleeding right away. And I can tell you there's tons more examples of that, but you're getting to that done point, uh, point even faster, right? You're out the door, you have those accessibility tests running and then boom, you're going um, and then stopping the accessibility bleed, right? Um, so with that, right, we've kind of talked about um, the examples of it and talked through it. We're gonna actually demo a couple of features with a bot solution. So I'm actually going to, um, jump on here and share um, our product, which is a test. So this is a test HTML. Um, it works within your development process itself. Um, so the example that I'm showing on here is actually um, a puppeteer integration. Um, it's actually one of our most popular ones. Um, in this example, I'm gonna say pretty high level, um, but in this example, I'm gonna kind of show you what a bot solution gets you to um, quickly, right? Um, so all it is in this aspect is I have a puppeteer test case, okay? Um, I'm testing against the demo page, which is the Q University's Mars demo, right? And all I wanna do is I'm gonna bring in the test puppeteer, which would be the bot solution, right? I'm gonna set it up, 
I'm going to launch my page. And at that time, all I'm going to do is call a test puppeteer and send in my page and I'm going to analyze it. And at this time, right, I'm getting those 40 to 60% accessibility violations at my build time, right? Um, so the cool part about it is you're getting that right away. All right, so again, going back to kind of what Tony said, you have professional support to help you get this in, get it set up, and then boom, you're off and running, right? It's the idea you can replicate it across different unit test cases. But the other added benefit of a bot tool is you get reporting, you get a bunch of different features come with it. Reporting is a huge one. Um, the biggest one here is um, I'm actually using a reporter to log my results. This will just get me a JSON object, but I can actually use the attest reporter itself to actually build an HTML file. Um, again, speaking from personal use, um, I've seen the HTML output from its built tool, right? Or a bot tool, I, I work wonders. Attach it to a Jenkins dashboard and all of a sudden, somebody who knows nothing about accessibility is all of a sudden like, whoa, why do we have 80 defects, right? Because they can see it in a nice neat format that comes out of it, right? So if I run this, which all of these in Puppeteer, I'm gonna run headless so you guys won't see a browser pop out. But when I run it, Right, I'm testing against this to Q University page that's on here. I'm gonna get the results back. When I do, and here I'll get an HTML file back, which I'll show you here in one second. Um, and again, this is all stuff you get from a bot solution, right? Um, you're getting more detail into your accessibility defects um, and getting that in front of people who may not know much about accessibility, right? The best story I can tell is somebody using this exact format you have right here. So this is what we get back. So I have violations, there are 42 violations that exist on that page alone, right? And if you look at it a lot of times, right, some of the built solutions just have kind of a council log comes back, right? For example, a team at my previous company was using this. They put this out here and they said, hey, okay, we attached the HTML document to the Jenkins dashboard. And now a manager went up to it and said, why do we have 42 issues of accessibility, right? The time was higher than that. And they're able to go out to here and look specifically at something that's a little bit more nice and neat um, and kind of showcases specifically what the issues are. Um, and you're able to see specifically your issues, right? Your incompletes, your passes, everything, right? But you're getting that in front of an audience that might not know that much accessibility. And now you're getting that buy-in from them. And, and that's, that's the biggest key when you look at a test reporting is being able to showcase this data right to somebody who might not know that much about accessibility um, holistically um, so now i'm going to turn it over to travis who's going to show um, a couple more features that a bot solution can have as well all right thanks mark thanks tony um so yeah just just to um you know, tie this back to, to what we've heard from um, mostly Mark, but Tony as well, so far is another way to really think about um, when you may be considering building your own solution is you've probably, uh, if you've thought about it in depth, kicked around the concept of, you know, what's, what's MVP, what's minimum viable product, right? And I've um, seen a lot of this at customers that end up buying a solution from us, for example, um, similar to what Mark has talked about, uh, that maybe, do, you know, execute the, the bare minimum amount of functionality, give you some uh, output that may be useful for one audience, but not another. So for example, Mark just showed us something that's really human readable and teams can react to without um, necessarily being developers. Another example of that, um, I can uh, show you just real quickly if I can get this zoom bar out of my way. Uh, would be um, the the same results from a test like that was just executed in Puppeteer coming into your build system directly, right? So I can see information about, um, you know, this isn't pretty because Jenkins isn't pretty by default, but whatever CI server you may be using would be able to consume those results. Um, and these are features on top of MVP, right? So these are things that um, aspirationally may be on a roadmap that you've sat down and thought about creating, but once you get into some of the things that Mark talked about earlier and uh, you're, you're thinking about rollout maintenance, you're getting feature requests and you're trying to maintain this solution, uh, it's often really difficult to get past MVP. 
And one of the most important things is thinking about the output of the tool. Uh, another thing to really consider is um, additional use cases beyond, you know, most of what we've looked at and thought about today is related to, um, you know, integrating into unit tests or end-to-end -end automated tests, right? The work of developers and quality engineers mostly. Um, but what about, uh, you know, features beyond that? What about getting the, um, you know, the value of the, of the tool that, that you want to build or buy, whichever the case may be, um, into some other uh, hands that may be able to uh, benefit from that. So I'm going to show you, um, I'm, I'm going to plug another part of the um, World Space a test tool here and kind of show you an example of that. So uh, in this scenario that we talked about with Mark, it's very similar to something that somebody may have tried to uh, integrate themselves with uh, perhaps the Axe Core library. Uh, we described some of the struggles that um, may have been encountered and how a bot solution may overcome some of those. Um, but what about non-developers? What about uh, letting other people uh, you know, use the tool? So an example of that, and I'm just gonna use this on a simple little to-do application I have here. Um, you can see I've already gone to lunch and I'm in my webinar now, uh, is, is a browser extension. So built on top of that same solution that we were looking at in Puppeteer and may be easily integrated into whatever other tool chains that you find across your organization, we also have this nice little browser extension that you can use to get that same information back. Uh, additionally, to take it even further, um, the you know after years and years of user-centered design and customer feedback and things like that, uh, you're also going to be able to, in this particular tool, go a little bit beyond uh, the things that you can detect with an open source rules engine such as Axe or, or similar. So in this particular case, uh, a developer who who's really just wants to do the right thing or has been instructed to make things as, as accessible as possible, or perhaps somebody responsible for accessibility testing, is going to have all these other tools that have been built on top of you know that that standard thing that can be automated. Uh, in terms of highlighting all of my headings on the page, um, getting a look at all links, lists, and a quick um, sanity check to see if you know the meaning matches um, the intent of the design. So a lot of different things that may uh, you know be on an aspirational roadmap, but you might never get to in terms of um, you know building a solution. Lastly, one of the other things to consider. Um, and, you know, making an assumption here just based on all of the people I've talked to in my experience, uh, myself included, Mark included, most people that are going to build a solution are going to use open source components and probably an open source rules library. Um, and whether you're a big or small organization, there's things to consider in terms of getting locked into um, a specific set of, of tests or checks or um, whether or not you want to fork that and maintain it on your own or just kind of deal with uh, what you've chosen to adopt. Um, that, and, you know, not to mention keeping up with it, the integrations that you've already put out across your development team, um, you know, things changing in Node and test frameworks that you have to keep compatibility up with. But what about the actual rules themselves? So you don't want um, your interpretation of accessibility to be locked in necessarily. Um, and you might also have uh, different places in your development teams that care more or less about particular rules. And I'll say that uh, with a giant asterisk because we, of course, believe all the checks are important. But um, for example, I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here. And you can see with this particular tool, and Mark could have done this as a quick configuration flag in his puppeteer test, um, I can choose another rule set. So I have a custom rule set that I created called Webinar Test. And um, what this does is just simply is a subset of all of the rules available in Axe Core. Uh, so to do this in my own solution I was building, I would probably have to fork and maintain that library myself. It wouldn't be quite so easy to push this out to others that are using the browser extension or a, a Java, a, a C Sharp, a Ruby, a JavaScript um, test framework. So that's another example. Um, that I can uh, choose to do there. And if I go back to analyze, what you're basically going to see is um, I have to actually say use the rule set. 
Uh, I took out rules related to color because I'm uh, on a sprint team and we're building features and we're not allowed to change colors. So that just helped me reduce noise. There's a lot of different scenarios. You might want to add your own rules that are very specific uh, to your organization's interpretation of accessibility guidelines. So that's another thing that a bot solution will probably enable you to get to faster. Again, not saying it's impossible to do um, on your own, but just something to consider, which is really the purpose of this webinar, I think, is not um, to discourage and say it's impossible to build a solution, uh, but to uh, give everybody information that Mark probably wishes he had way back in, in the day when he was, uh, that story that he told us. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna give my screen back. All right, sorry about the little lag there. Here we go. Thanks, Travis. Sorry about that. Getting set back up again. Um, as Travis said, you know, we're not trying to discourage people from one or the other. We're just trying to give everybody all the information that we have and, and stories that we've seen from customers um, or even personal stories from trying to do accessibility out in the field. But um, you know, if you still want to really work on an accessibility solution and it's something that you want to play around with, um, we here at DQ have our own open source solution called Axcore, and we definitely welcome contribu contributors that aren't just you know DQ employees. We have um, around 100 contributors, uh, 25 million downloads. Woo -woo, we're super proud of that. Uh, Microsoft uses us in house, and uh, if you're using Lighthouse Dev Tools you're also using Axe Core in the audit feature. So something to consider if you're still, you know, in the mood to really get your hands dirty and start working on some accessibility um, open source tooling. So with that, um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Travis. I was just gonna re um, underscore that. It's a great community and there's, um, there's, there's feature requests and sometimes maybe even bugs and it, it's um, come one, come all. It, it's, a, it's a great place to, um, I believe Mark referred to it as a spark, right? Like developers inherently have an itch to um, contribute and that's a great place to get started or, or just follow it and see what's going on in that, um, in that particular repository. Great, thanks Travis. Um, so thanks to our panelists. I think it's time for us to dive into some questions. Um, you know, I think you guys did a really good job of covering um, you know, reasons why it can be difficult uh, for especially large organizations to um, go with a built solution. But um, say that, you know, you're an organization, you're a developer, ready, you know that you need a, you need a bot solution. What are some arguments that you can make um, to your managers uh, for going that route? You know, what are some things that you can say to your uh, managers to convince them to go with a bot solution? Um, besides, you know, the, the potential issues you could run into with the, with the built solution. I, I think, I think the, the easiest argument, and I've, and I've kind of had that same scenario, is, you know, go, going in, if you go in and just kind of say, we have to have a bot solution because this isn't going to work, right? Um, there's two things you can do. The one thing is to kind of lay out the effort that it takes. So similar to what the slides we had, right? All the things that you've done, right? Um, to see all that, if somebody can see that, right, you have evidence to show it, um, that's one way. The other way too, um, and this has been done at other places, and I've seen it done at other places too, is kind of get that, get the view and the landscape of your organization, right? And showcase, right, depending on, depending on how much, right, how, how much accessibility issues you have, if you're under litigation, things like that, right? If you show the return value and how quick something can get set up, right? Um, and how quickly a holistic approach can get you there. Um, that's the argument that I've made before and it, it's one, right? Um, being able to showcase all the data that it takes to basically say, we're gonna get up and running really quick. Um, that allows you to win the argument and not even win the argument, kind of just showcase, we need to do a bot solution so we can get closer to done, right? Kind of like we talked about with stopping the bleeding. Um, if you do that, then that can actually really help you win that argument for a bot solution in that case. 
Yeah, Mark, I, I think that's a good point. You know, I think the other thing too that comes up a lot is it comes down to resources. So there's there's a lot of different things that, you know, like factor into this, if it's a large organization, if it's a small organization, but it doesn't matter if you're large or small, a lot of times, you know, like developers are under a time crunch, they've got limited resources with the current workload that they have, you know, being able to shift that over to, you know, like a partner that come in and, and help facilitate, you know, this, um, you know, th this, uh, you know, kind of like adopting new practice of, of testing and, and uh, all that comes along with it is, is challenging. It takes time. And um, the other part of it in regards to the, uh, the level of domain level knowledge that you need to kind of like really know that you're covering all your bases uh, with accessibility. So I think that's also something that kind of like rings true for small organizations. You know, if you just have a single developer or you know maybe just a small team um the chances that you've got that domain level knowledge that you know like really gives you the confidence around you know are we covering all of our bases you know if, if we put this effort into it is it is it worth our while and, and are we going the full uh you know like the, like you know are we covering everything that we need to cover like like when we're putting this application together so there's a lot of unknowns there. Um, I, I think like with the built solution, you have a lot more confidence and you know, you've got the ability to shift some of those resources over onto you know, a partner that can help you along that journey. And I, I think that's really important. Cool. There's a, can we jump in and do some of the um, submissions, Laura? Yeah, sure, go for it, Travis. Great, so there's a, um, Couple in here. There's a great question. It is accessibility insights from Microsoft using AxCore under the hood. Um, that was from Michael. Um, yes, in fact, it is, and um, that's a great example of uh, you know if you if you're that big and strong and have that those types of resources, uh, it may make sense to build a solution. Um, we had hoped to be able to share some real um, figures on their effort in ongoing. Um, team size to maintain that tool, but unfortunately I wasn't able to pull it together, but um, they did uh, a lot to uh, use AxCore under the hood for the automated portion of that tool. Which is another thing that maybe was implied, but if, if, if you still decide to build your own tool, please use AxCore. <laughs> that's, that's the best starting place. Um, so I'm just gonna throw out another question that I see in Q&A. So we talked a lot about, um, I mean, this whole webinar is on automated accessibility testing, um, but Linda does have an interesting question, which we've seen come up a lot in, in accessibility nowadays is, you know, source code remediation with accessibility versus um, overlays for accessibility. So I'm wondering, um, Tony, if you want to kind of jump in on that one or possibly Mark. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, like I've, I've been really, uh, you know, like I've been involved a lot with the DQ. Um, we, uh, we have a service that does overlays and I've, you know, that been heavily involved in that and developing that product out. And, you know, like this question kind of plays to, you know, kind of like pros and cons. And so, you know, anybody that you talk to that, you know, like from a, you know, kind of like mission critical, you know, like, like what, what would be the best way to, you know, fix, our application, you know, a lot of folks will say, yeah, you know, go to the source code, fix it there, you know, do it the right way. Um, a lot of tools, uh, you know, that we have, you know, including XCore, you know, wh whatever the case, you know, it helps you identify some of those issues, uh, but it doesn't actually like identify all the issues, you know, like there's a lot of stuff that kind of come into play with doing things like assessments, you know, having folks that are subject matter experts go through your site, make sure you got all the issues flagged. And, you know, there, there's a, a lot that goes into something like that, um, you know, kind of plays back to the domain level knowledge point of view. And then um, like overlay, you know, like as a, um, as a solution, it, I think it's a great solution. Um, it, it, it definitely has its pros and cons. You know, pros is that it is something that you can usually implement fairly quickly, you know, so if there's, um, you know, some kind of pending deadline uh, that you're, you, you know, forced to meet, um, that, that is a good tool to have, you know, it's a good tool to consider. 
Uh, the other benefit that it can give you is, you know, you could take both approaches. You know, you could go from a, a point of view where, you know, you could use an overlay as a good short-term solution to provide cover for developers or, you know, like a source code remediation effort. And then once, you know, that source code's all patched up, you can pull those overlays off and, you know, really to the end user, um, they wouldn't really see much of a difference. So I, I think like, you know, when, when you're considering a solution like overlays versus going, you know, full on source code remediation, uh, you have to kind of, you know, factor in some of those different pros and cons. Yeah. And playing off of that too, Tony, you said it absolutely right. We had that same scenario at the place that I was too, where we had to stop um, the bleeding for a couple of these different applications we had. And so we did have overlays for them, right? And the idea behind it was we could buy time so that we could get uh, a tool set up in the build process, get developers more familiar with accessibility. And it worked wonders because there was enough time to get the content accessible, but then also get your developers the idea of, of how to make content accessible behind the scenes. It worked wonders. Um, for one team that we had in particular, um, because now when they go out the door, everything was accessible, right? It gave them that time and then the overlay was taken off. All right, so this is another thing adding on to what Tony said there. Yep, and I, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I, I in my uh, former role, uh, lived that same situation that Mark is describing. I'm gonna put a link in the chat to the um, overlay solution that DQ offers. It's a little off topic for the webinar, but it's a great question. Yeah, and can we, um, I'm realizing that some people might not know what an accessibility overlay is slash does. So could we just briefly describe that just so people are aware of how that's different from a automated testing solution? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so typically what an overlay does is it's a little bit of code that gets included uh, on a customer website, um, you know, typically JavaScript, you know, embedded like a typical JavaScript resource would be. And uh, it kind of patches the DOM on um, the, like what, what the user sees or experiences the website, uh, you know, so if there's some accessibility issues, you know, maybe there's some missing attributes or, um, you know, things like color contrast can be addressed in this way. Um, it's a way of kind of having like a single point of entry to remediate like a, a wide range of issues on, on a site um, just by, you know, going about it. Uh, from like an overlay standpoint. So um, it can be something that can be developed, you know, rather quickly, like, like, I, like I said, uh, you know, previously, but, um, you know, there are, you know, like I said, pros and cons. I mean, like, it's probably off topic for this to go too far into it, but, uh, you know, there's uh, ways that you can fix like a wider range of things. It's actually surprising some of the stuff that you can fix, you know, from like a, you know, complex uh, website standpoint, but, uh, I, you know, I, I've always thought that it, it's it's a real good tool to start out with, uh, depending on what the scope of the project is. You know, it really has to kind of fit the use case, um, you know, to be something that, you know, should be considered. But, uh, you know, all in all, I've, I've always had real good success, uh, you know, with customers that have come to us and, and needed that kind of help. So I'm a big fan. <laughs> Thanks. Just want to make sure but people had a solid understanding. Um, and background on that. Um, and then I think Travis, you answered this question in chat, but the tool that uh, you were showing is our workspace to test tool um, when you were doing your Jenkins build. So we have another question here um, from Michael asking, does the DQ conformance testing model come with uh, DQ testing tools for development slash test engineering or QA teams to follow? I can take a crack at that. Uh, that that's a great question too, Michael. I, I think, um, and Tony and Mark can kind of keep me honest here, but I, I would say for uh, development and test engineering teams, the testing model is sort of inherently built into the rules. So it's, it's pretty uh, well described. Well, another thing you get out of these tools is not only um, pointing out failures, but describing why they're failures and, and remediation uh, steps and good practices to avoid them in the future. Uh, QA is a little bit different. So our, um, for example, if you hired DQ to do a comprehensive manual assessment of um, an, an application or a site, uh, the tool that we use to perform that uh, is also a tool that we provide to our customers. Uh, and it, it does build in that methodology into a, a, a platform. 
that helps you execute tests consistently, but also um, do some other things like capture uh, uh, issues and, and do some reporting. That, that tool is called Assure, WorldSpace Assure. Great, thanks Travis. Um, it looks like we've come to the end of our questions, so I think we can wrap up a little early here today. I want to thank uh, Tony and Travis and Mark for um, doing a great job. Uh, if, you, if anyone thinks of a question after the fact, feel free to email me and I'll pass that along to our panelists. Again, this webinar um, was being recorded, so we'll send out the recording in the slides via email. And I hope everybody has a great rest of their Tuesday oh, afternoon. Sorry, Laura, can I add one more answer? Um, sure, go for I, it. I see that you helped Leslie with Axe Core, but to just to answer the the original question of, um, you know, what would you recommend to a solo developer that needs a solution for smaller companies? Mm -hmm. uh, I would absolutely start with Axe Core and check out some of the um, uh, things you can do with that, as well as the browser extension. Great. A little bit different than than Axe Pro, but it sounds like Laura's going to get you going with that as well. Yeah, we'll get you taken care of, Leslie. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your afternoon.